We began this sermon series and we talked about the primacy of the kingdom. So let's begin right here. It's election time in our nation, uh, 30 days until we have that election. I don't know what you think about this election, but I bet you are much like I am in which uh, you struggle a tad bit with skepticism or cynicism. Uh, It's easy to grow tired with politics, uh, with Washington. It's easy to grow weary with all the stuff that's going on with the finger pointing and the not so encouraging news that's going on in our nation. A lot of what you hear uh, from Washington reminds me of the story of David and Goliath. We have two different groups standing on the the hills with the valley in between and they are catcalling, they are finger pointing, they are talking all manner of evil against one another, itching for a fight only to go back to their camps and there to rest in order to come back out and do it again and again and again. And that seems to be the routine of our nation right now. For the next month, the people in Washington, they are going to be attacking each other and throwing mud and making accusations, and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be tacky. Sometimes you think you could find more maturity in our day school than you can in Washington. Folks, it's easy to grow cynical. It's easy to grow fearful. We're concerned about our country. What a year we have had. COVID-19. We have racial tensions, uh, protests, masks, sheltering in cities in flames, lockdown of businesses, increase of suicides, hurricane after hurricane, tornadoes, massive fires out west, the appointment of a Supreme Court judge, and on and on we can go. Where where does it stop? Who would have thought that we would be marked by 2020 this way with all that we've had to deal with? These are difficult days. Violence and chaos seem to be the watchwords and the default reactions. No one seems to know how to solve all of the upheaval and divisiveness that's going on in our country. And along with the struggle in Washington, we have other issues that decline uh, our nation's morality. I don't consider myself old or old-fashioned, but to look back 10 years ago and the things that we kept at uh, arm's length and were prohibited or unthinkable uh, are part of our TV today that you can watch without any trouble at all. Uh, We live in a season where we can't agree on God's definition of the family. We can't seem to stand up for the rights of the unborn. There's a segment of our nation that seems to be only happy when everyone else is unhappy so they want everyone to be just unhappy like them. And so layer upon layer, it just seems to build. And it can cause you to fret. It can cause you to be anxious about the future of this country. Yet there's a message of hope. A hope that can be found in this turmoil that desperately needs to be shared. Because we can let others be anxious. We can let others argue. We can let others be divisive. Why? Because found in Scripture and found through God's work in history, we find a hope that has been set in place that we can hang our hat on. Simply put, it matters less who occupies the White House. What matters most is who occupies the throne. That our Heavenly Father is over the nations, and God uses the nations, God uses this nation, God uses other nations in order to accomplish His perfect will. Really, Bill? Absolutely. That means that we as believers, we see politics, and we see this life of ours through a different, different set of lens. We don't see our hope in the results of an, of an election. Uh, we have our hope uh, through the sovereign plan of God. Because as followers of Jesus, we are not people just of this nation. 
We're people of the kingdom. And our God has a plan that he has put in place. A plan that uh, we can find our peace and our rest in. We can find our hope. I want to show you some examples in the Bible as we move toward Matthew 16. Just example after example of God's sovereignty, God's plan for this world, for our nations, of how he rules over the nation. It's an interesting study, if you give yourself to it, of just identifying time and time again of God's hand and how he ruled the nation. Uh, Let's look at these examples. Uh, It's going to be on the screen, but you can turn to Exodus 3. Because in Exodus 3, there's the children of Israel. They've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God heard the cry of the slavery and the misery that was going on in Egypt. He goes and he shoulder taps uh, Moses. He says, I want you to go and deliver my people from that. And with that backdrop, here's what I want us to see. I want you to hear the voice of God as he speaks to Moses here in Exodus 3. We look at verse 16. Voice of God, hear it. Now go, Moses, and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He, God, told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites and Hittites and the rest of those people mentioned now live. Now notice how God's plan unfolds. God is saying these words. He says to Moses, verse 18, the elders of Israel will accept your message. Do not miss that, folks. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt or Pharaoh and tell him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please, let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Let's look further. Still, this is God speaking. Verse 19. But I know. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless. Unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. Verse 21. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and the fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Who could have thought that any of this would have happened? I mean, we know the story, right? Moses, he goes back to Egypt. God sends the ten plagues in order to soften the heart of Pharaoh in order to release the children of Egypt. Egypt. Pharaoh finally consents to let the people go giving them their freedom. And we know that part of the story. What we don't often know is the part that we find there in verse 21 of Exodus 3. Look again. It says, and I, God, will cause, will cause what? The Egyptians to look favorably on you. And boy, did he. If you read the rest of verse 21 and 22, you see exactly what God did and how he moved the heart of the Egyptians because it was like the Israelites were saying uh, we're leaving and we want to take your Range Rover Uh, we're taking the Mercedes we're taking your bank account we're taking your jewelry I, I really like that outfit I think I'll take that as well And the Egyptians were willing to let all of that go. And the Israelites left Egypt. There were one to two million of them leaving Egypt. Uh, They not only left with their freedom, but they were loaded down with all the valuable gifts and all the possessions uh, that the Egyptians had showered on them. I think I'll take that. Got it. Can I help you load it up? 
What else you need? It was giveaway day in Egypt. Here's the deal. Here's what it all comes down to. God had softened the heart of the Egyptians. God had softened the heart of the oppressors toward the oppressed. How? Because of Moses' persuasion? Not so. Because of Pharaoh's strategy? Wrong again. Only because God managed and oversaw the hearts of the Egyptians. God was over the nations, his sovereign rule. Fulfilling verse 17. I have promised to rescue you from oppression. God did this in Egypt. And there are many more examples that we have throughout the Bible of God's sovereignty and God's plan for the nation. Take, for example, uh, what we find in the book of Daniel. If you turn there, uh, Daniel and the Babylonian official. Daniel was taken into captivity as a young man into Babylon. Uh, one of the requests that Daniel made of the one that was overseeing him in Babylon was that he would have a change of diet. He did not like the rich. He did not like the fatty foods uh, that were being served in uh, the palace. And so he said, I would like a change of diet. We don't think much about that request, but look on the screen or in your Bible in Daniel 1:10. Uh, we find the official struggle in granting Daniel's request. Uh, this official said to Daniel, verse 10, I am afraid of my Lord the king, meaning Nebuchadnezzar, who has assigned your food and drink to you. Why should Nebuchadnezzar see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Then the official gets down to the fear underneath the struggle he has of granting this request because he says the king would have my head because of you. The official knew that his life was at stake if he granted this request of changing Daniel's food. But look back one verse. Verse 9. This, this verse shows what prompted the official to even consider Daniel's request in the first place, even if his life was on the line. Because in verse 9, Daniel 1, it says, Now God had caused. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. And from there, the story goes that Daniel bargained with this official. Uh, let's just test this new diet for 10 days. And they came to a resolution where they would do that, that test for 10 days. And then in verse 14, we see that resolution. It says, so the official agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Are we seeing this? This official's life was on the line. But because of God's favor, because of God operating in the official's heart, uh, who was not a follower of God... That heart was softened. It softened. It was changed, granting Daniel's request according to God's plan. Let's look at one more example. Then we're going to make some application for our world today. How about this little known um, story that we can read right over? It's found in Exodus 34. It deals with the feast that God had ordained for the Hebrew people to follow. Feasts where they would go so they could remember the goodness of God. And God desperately wanted them to do this. So what did God do in order for them to have that opportunity? Well, let's look at it in Exodus 34, verse 23 and 24. It says, three times a year, all your men are to appear before the, what's the words? Sovereign Lord. Three times a year... All your men are to be, appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory. And no one will covet your land when, when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. So let's think about this. <clears throat> God says all your men, all your men are to gather three times a year 
at this one place in order to worship me. Simply put, leave your farms, leave your businesses, leave your military outposts, and I want you all to gather at this one location. Well, let's put ourselves where a Hebrew would be. What would you be thinking? How can I leave my farm? How can I leave my business? How can I leave this military outpost and leave the borders of Israel unprotected? And God said, I've got it. God said, no one, if you look in Scripture, what I just read, no one will covet your land. No one will even think about it. It won't cross their mind. Can you imagine God gave them such comfort. He issued this guarantee that I'll secure the borders. I'll protect your land. That protection is on me, said God. When you come to worship me, when you put me first, I'll protect everything else. You don't have to worry. And no one's going to want your work. No one is going to want your land. Uh, they won't even have that thought that will cross their mind. What a guarantee. What a declaration that God just made. Let's not miss this. God controls the desires of neighboring countries, neighboring clans, neighboring enemies. God controls the desires of the people. Just some examples of how God and his sovereign plan rules over the nations. So let's take a step back and let's add it all up. So who prompted the Egyptians to uh, give the supplies and wealth to the Israelites? God did. Who prompted the official in Babylon to grant Daniel's request for a new diet? God did. Who watched over the land so the Hebrews could go up and to worship? God did. God did then. God does today. God is over the nations. He's over the nations then. He's over the nations today. He's the same, same God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's why King David could say these words. We find it in the Psalms where David says, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in the heaven? He says, you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Isn't that comforting news for us? God has this. God has this even when uh, it looks so messy, when it looks so out of control. There's no solution in sight. Here's an application that you and I need to make. Maybe you've heard this this week. Maybe you've said it. The phrase is, if President Trump wins the election, it's all over for our, for our nation. Or, if Joe Biden wins the election, our nation is going down the tubes. Really? Really? Do you honestly think that heaven is troubled by this election? Is God having trouble sleeping at night because of the outcome of the election on November 3rd? Is God wringing his hands anxiously about what's going to happen? I don't think so either. Listen, let others be anxious. Let others get their lives tied up in knots. I've been there. Let others cast their hope in the choice for the Oval Office. Here's what we do as children of God, citizens of this nation, yet citizens of the kingdom. Here's what we do. We vote. Do not take for granted that freedom to vote. Read the platforms. Understand how you should vote according to those platforms. But vote. We think. We pay attention. We develop God-honoring opinions. 
We pay our taxes. We do our civil duty. Some of you will be engaged in campaigning for a candidate. Way to go. Do that. Some of you will feel the pull that you need to run for office. We need God-fearing, God-leading uh, individuals, leading over our community and our nation. Go for it. But what we don't do, uh, we don't fret. We do not freak out and think everything is going down the tubes if this election goes this way or that. We know, we know that no matter who is in the Oval Office, God is on the throne. To put it in a sentence, we place our trust in the work of God. How many nations has God seen come and go? How many kings has God seen come and go? How many presidents elected has God put in place in and out of that Oval Office? God is not troubled. And because God is not troubled and we believe in God, we should not be as in trouble as well. Yes, we are concerned and we need to be concerned, but our hope is in God. I'm just like all of you. I love being a citizen of this nation to be an American. I love that. But I love even more being a citizen of heaven. And long after this moment of history has come and gone, and we look back at all that has happened in this time period that we have been given to live, we will be grateful. But even at that time, we will always be citizens of heaven because we cast our ultimate hope uh, with Jesus Christ who is on the throne. That's what prompted this message, this first message of this sermon series on the kingdom of Matthew 16. Jesus was with his disciples and he looked at them and he asked, who do you say that I am? And they spoke right up. They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say that uh, you are one of the prophets. And Jesus received that. But then he looked at Peter. And he asked, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? In this season of upside down, folks, that is what we have to answer. When it seems like it's nothing but a mess, when we just want to get so angry, who do we say that he is? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And folks, that is our hope as citizens of this kingdom and citizens of this nation. What do we do with all of this? Well, I went back in my sermon files. I went back four years to our last election. Max Lucado was asked to lead a national prayer emphasis. You may have participated in that. I know I did. And I loved what Max said because Max said that if you read First and Second Timothy, the call of the church is to pray. The call of the church is to pray. Pray for its leaders. That is our first thing that we are to do. Max reminded us we're to pray for the king and, and for uh, those that are positions of authority. And that would mean for us that we pray for our presidents, we pray for our Congress. Whether the candidate that was elected was our personal preference or not, our duty as believers, we are to pray for that president and for those elected officials. We cannot sidestep that assignment, even if it means swallowing our pride to do so. We are called to pray. Paul explains it this way in Romans 13, verse 3. It's on the screen. There is no authority except that which God established. 
the authority that exists has been established by God. Verse 4. That ruler appointed is God's servant. He's God's servant whether he realizes it or not. Because God rules over the nation with a sovereign plan. Back in 2016, he led us through that national time of prayer. And he says we are to pray for three things. He says that we are to pray that Unite us. Unite our country. We are weary of being divided and polarized. Unite us. Strengthen us. Strengthen our resolve. Strengthen our morality and our faithfulness. We might be living out the very requests we made uh, to remove God from our nation. Who knows? Strengthen us. And the third thing we pray is to appoint and to anoint our next president. We want who you want, God. That's what we want, right? We want who you want, oh God, to appoint and to anoint our next president. Max made it easy as I looked in my file. I smiled as I remembered four years ago we pray that we will be united strengthen us and appoint and anoint U S A God is a ruler of nations he has a sovereign plan that we can trust the bottom line who do you say that he is it's in him that we find our hope and our trust Jesus was with his disciples the final night that he was here on this earth and with his disciples he took common elements that had been part of their life as a Hebrew and he took a loaf of bread that common element and he said this is my body which is given for you for you do this in remembrance of me and after the meal he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus looking at those disciples as he looks at us today. My body, my blood. You are citizens of this nation. You're citizens of the kingdom. And as I send you out, being my body, may they see the difference of who you are as you live among all the mess that we can't fix. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are so grateful for this time. Thank you that you do have a sovereign plan that we don't understand. But as people of faith, we rest in who you are. And we trust you completely and fully. Lord, I pray for myself as I pray for my brothers and sisters. That in all the anxiousness and all the stuff that we're going to walk through the next 30 days that people will see a calmness, a, a peace uh, in our soul an understanding that, that will open up a door for conversation. Uh, what, what is it that makes it different for you? Where we can just say, well, I hope. Our hope is in Jesus, a son of the living God. And that's what we confess and profess. Uh, steal our soul. Give us your peace. And give us your rest. 
It's in the sweet name of Jesus I pray. Amen.